Hello, um, and welcome everybody to the first OI author of conversation of the academic year. I'm Kathy Kelly. I'm the editor of books and the interim executive director of the Omahundro Institute. And I'm delighted to see all of you here today. As you may know, we launched this series last year when the pandemic had closed off so many opportunities to gather, um, to present and to discuss new work and brewing debates. Things are opening up back up again, hooray, hooray, hooray. Um, but this series proved so popular that we opted to continue it, even though things are, as we say, now opening back up again. Thank you so much for joining us today in a discussion of private profits and public affairs. I'm eager to get started, but before we do, I'd like to offer William & Mary's land grant acknowledgement. William & Mary acknowledges the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today. The Cherowin Hakka Nataway, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Mataponi, Monacan, Nansamond, Nottaway, Pamunkey, Potawomac, Upper Mataponi, and Rappahannock tribes, and we pay our respect to their tribal members past and present. Though we aren't yet back in the Omahundro Institute offices in Williamsburg on William and Mary's campus, that acknowledgement stands as a powerful reminder of our history and our obligations. And now to the event at hand. I cannot tell you how delighted I am, how very, very happy I am to introduce today's guests. As many of you know, the history of capitalism, or maybe it's the new history of capitalism, or maybe by now we're at the new, new, new history of capitalism, that history is ascendant. It's launched, launched conferences and symposia and edited volumes and monographs, and now it's featured in job descriptions. Um, you can't swing a cat, it seems, without running up against some new study that productively intervenes in discussions of economy and polity. And yet for all that good work from all of those very fine scholars, today's guests are distinguished by the rigor and the creativity of their work by their uncanny ability to pull us deep into the weeds of economic activity, and then show us exactly why those weeds should have mattered to us in the first place, should have mattered to us, in fact, all along. Michael Zakim is professor of history at Tel Aviv University. He writes widely on the economy and culture, and he is the author most recently of Accounting for Capitalism, The World the Clerk Made, which was published by the University of Chicago Press. Hannah Farber is assistant professor of history at Columbia University. Her first book, Underwriters of the United States, will be out this fall, I think in just a couple of weeks, and is published by the Omahundro Institute in conjunction with the University of North Carolina Press. Um, if you look at the website, if you look in the chat boxes, there are all kinds of um, things that you can click on that will give you discounts to both of those books and indeed to all of Michael's publications at Chicago. So I encourage you to take advantage of all of that. A note about process before we begin. Please feel free to put your questions for Michael and for Hannah in the chat box. We've set aside some time at the end for audience Q&A and I'll be more than happy to ask questions and we can get some dialogue going at that point in time. Okay, now let's start. That's enough of me. Let's go to Michael and to Hannah. And I wanna begin by, by reminding us and by saying that in my introduction to you both today, I stress that one of the things that I admire most about your work is its originality. And in fact, Michael and Hannah and Emily Suth is our editorial assistant who's backstage monitoring and running this whole show. One of the things that we were talking about before we began is how much I admire the originality and the creativity of both Michael's and Hannah's work. You both examine the past through lenses, through subjects that other scholars have ignored. And they've ignored the kinds of things that you focus in on, either because they were obscure or because they were ubiquitous. They're the, they're the kinds of things that form the wallpaper of economic life and activity. Other people look through them, you home in and explore them. And you use these subjects, whether we're talking about men's dress or the lives of clerks or accounting forms or marine insurance, insurance policies to raise really broad questions about the nature of the American past. At this point, the payoffs are obvious, but hindsight is always 2020. And I'd love to know, I'd love to begin by asking you how, um, 
how how you identified your topics. How did you come to the kinds of question, the kinds of subjects that you write about? Um, why did they seem compelling to you at the beginning of your projects? Maybe that's a good point of entry for us, simply to think about how it is that you both came to enter into such really creative and novel ways of looking at the past. I don't know, Hannah, do you want to start? I could start. Thank you for having me, Kathy. Thanks to the Institute for hosting the conversation. I'm thrilled to be here and to be in conversation with Michael as well. Um, I went to grad school looking for what I thought would be daring tales of adventure on the high seas uh, in the age of the early American Republic, a new nation and stories of swashbuckling Napoleonic adventure, maybe for probably pretty crude psychological reasons as a young adult on my own journey. And um, as I started reading through uh, some of the actual papers that were produced um, in this age of maritime adventure, um, what I found was a lot of number crunching and a lot of paperwork, um, and including these sporadic but consistent and just un incessant references to insurance, which at first I just thought was really funny because it was such a disjuncture between what I thought people would be talking about um, uh, astride the oceans and what they were actually talking about, not only uh, commercial figures, but naval figures as well. So one of the first stories that um, really grabbed me, and that's uh, in sort of this key moment of my book now, is when the uh, the American playwright utopian Mordechai Noah is on a, an American merchant ship on his way to Tunis, where he's supposed to be uh, an, Amer an American consul there, um, a job for which, by the way, he has no training and no experience, but James Madison has this vague idea that Jews all know each other and therefore that it, with, what with there being Jews in Tunis, he would be a good person to fill that role. Um, the merchant ship that he's on is captured by a British naval ship who is checking to see if they're carrying French goods, which of course they are. This is not really Noah's concern, but in any case, he's sort of bemused by what happens next, which is that the British naval captain uh, invites him on board, offers him some drinks, uh, they're tippling and he, the, the naval captain sort of starts needling him about the Americans um, and their persistence in trading in routes that, uh, that are causing them to be captured by British naval ships and privateers. And the British naval captain, he like draws out this chart and he says, look, we've been doing the count. You Americans think that if, if you even get one ship out of three through our blockades, um, you'll make enough profits for your... Um, commerce in the world to be worthwhile. And he says, first of all, you're not getting through one out of three. We're getting you at a higher rate than that. So he's got some sort of um, back of the envelope calculation going on there. And not only are you not getting your, this many ships through, but even if you were, the, the, the math wouldn't work. So you, you've got this all wrong. And then he says, you know, in, in his cups at this point, happy with his price, he said, well, if your insurance companies don't mind, we have no problem with continuing on with this war. Um, so this story for me crystallized the the ways in which so much of the the Napoleonic era combat and really um, the American challenge in the world and its first generation has to do with commercial establishment. Um, this commercial establishment has to do with certain kinds of risk calculation that filter out to not just um, the world of the paper pushers, but to political figures and military figures too. There are French newspaper clippings that say, oh, you know, you, yeah, everybody be, better be careful. The insurers all around the world should take note, um, you know, Napoleon's vessels are on the rampage and nobody's going to get by us. So I, I thought this was like tremendously funny, but this also became a route into understanding a deep, rich, um, complicated infrastructure where if you sort of, if, if you take the shipping world and you like turn it upside down, um, you find this world of calculation. Um, not always good calculation. That's part of the story too. Certainly not politically objective calculation, but that's part of the story too. Terrific. Um, I want to get to Michael and then we'll come back to some of this. So you're asking about the sources of my yeah. How scholarly you... agenda. Mm -hmm. hey, I like that question a lot. I appreciate you asking it. And I want to take advantage of the opportunity to actually think about 
think about some of those sources of my scholarly agenda, of my political agenda, of my personal agenda. In fact, I think it's a very personal question, by the way. And I, uh, and I make that observation in the most positive sense of the word. It's, so it's really about, I guess, the formation of my own sensibility or my own sense or my own sense of how to be in the world. And that's almost Heideggerian way we understand that very modern condition where there is no obvious answer and there's certainly no traditional answer anymore. So I, uh, I spent uh, the first decade or so of my adulthood uh, very much in the world, but not in the academy, and quite consciously so, not in the academy. Um, I, I farmed most of, the, uh, most of those years. I spent, I had a two, two and a half year stint uh, doing semi-skilled factory work. I soldiered, of course, but mostly what I did was I read but I read very little history. I read very little American history. And of course I was outside of America altogether, outside of the loop you could say, and outside the conversation or the discourse. And I think that actually also served to my advantage, at least in the terms that you uh, 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 referred to earlier. So I read a lot of art history and I read a lot of music theory and I read a lot of Bible, but mostly I read political philosophy and critical theory. And most of all, I read um, and was deeply influenced by three modern German thinkers, or perhaps three, it, 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 more specifically, three German thinkers about modernity. That was Karl Marx, Walter Benjamin, and Hannah Arendt, uh, who, who it convinced me that, in fact, there are political questions, questions of police, questions of relations with others, and uh, questions of um, uh, uh, questions of authority and, and, and power uh, are inescapable, and they're part of our everyday quotidian lives, even though they often pretend not to be. Uh, all these three, Marx, Arendt, and Benjamin, were also all very profoundly skeptical in regards to liberal promises about freedom, not to mention the specious nature of equality in liberal societies. And they also kind of invited me to think about what in fact constitutes freedom, both, uh, uh, both on a, a personal or in the private sphere, as we allude, uh, as we kind of allude to in the title of our uh, uh, conversation today, and of course for the public more generally, and of course the interrelationship between uh, the personal and the public. So in, in any way, uh, uh, what I learned, mostly what I learned from them was that in, a liberal power, liberal authority is often disguised as the opposite. That is, it resides in the far less explicit regions or shadowy places where no one's really speaking directly about, in, about command over others. And that belongs obviously to a, a pre-liberal, a pre-modern a, a, a chapter in American history. It obviously, it belongs to the slave South, but it doesn't belong to what became, of course, industrial capitalist liberalism. And uh, so I went out looking for the less obvious uh, uh, places where uh, the less explicitly political places where I was convinced, in fact, uh, where command and authority and, uh, and power were, uh, were exercised and far more effectively because of their implicit nature, because of their, uh, 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 because of their apolitical a lexicon or grammar in which they were discussed. One could talk about that. In, it, so I went looking for places that were, I guess you could say hidden in plain sight, which I think is, uh, uh, which is usually a more direct inspiration for anthropologists rather than historians who, are, who tend to focus on, a, on a, the more obvious a, a, a lacuna, what's missing and thus the, play, the, 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 the pieces in the puzzle that are missing that need to be explained. I, I was less, um, less it, it driven uh, by that kind of approach than uh, looking for what, uh, it, what was hidden in plain sight. So, so writing about clothing and more particularly about the ready-made business suit or the invention of the ready-made business suit uh, was one rather obvious example uh, or the, uh, uh, the bourgeoisie's need to turn women into victims in the 19th century, which has a lot to do of course 
with, uh, uh, with prostitution, which is not at all an ancient profession, but it's in fact, as Baudelaire explained to us in the 1850s, a distinctly modern profession, now, right? The flip side of uh, the capitalist coin. And other kind of marginal places or ostensibly marginal uh, places to be in the world, paperwork more recently, statistics and accounting, a pandemic of constipation that broke out in the United States after 1830, and which I argue was extremely important in constituting, uh, a, 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 constituting a new kind of citizen who, uh, who was a, a, a capable of, a, a, a capable of a, exercising his, his, uh, his new sovereignty, his new a, exclusive sovereignty over himself, but it, in the same years, it gets called uh, the self-made man, which is an important neologism of the same time. So, so I so I'm drawn to what you could say is the uh, are is the banal uh, uh, aspects of our lives. In fact, that's one uh, 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 difference I have with Hannah Arendt. I've often uh, thought that the banality of evil was not Nazis, and the banality of evil is capitalism. So I was also drawn to write about, so uh, to, uh, I've been a socialist my whole adult life. So it became important to me to understand, uh, to understand the other side better. It's something that the labor history and the social history being written in the 70s and 80s when I was in college didn't do, didn't do. They kind of left that, that, ha that, that uh, uh, half of the equation in, the, in a, for uh, use some kind of double entry metaphor yeah, that how that that side of the books was left out, and that is uh, in fact how capital, uh, how capital in fact was transformed into an ism, into a social scheme, an inclusive social scheme, uh, with claims to of relevance to every aspect of again both private and public life, and uh, and um, and uh, so so interestingly. Uh, uh, I could also I could also describe my orientation as being one driven by a curiosity about the winners. I, I'm a loser. I belong to the losing side of history. And I've often thought that, in fact, the victory over fascism in the middle of the 20th century kind of misled us all into thinking or assuming that the winner, that, 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 that the good guys usually win in history. Of course, that's a very important kind of working assumption uh, for the kind of uh, political theory that that uh, uh, that um, dominates uh, American uh, discourse over the past 200 or 250 years as well. I don't think, uh, obviously, uh, lately, I think uh, everyone is, is, is slowly begun to wake up to the to the to the possibility that in fact things aren't getting better, but are getting worse. And uh, so I was uh, very much uh, uh, motivated to try to understand, in fact, how capital uh, came to power, how, in fact, capital came, uh, 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 became capitalism, or, in fact, how, how the market achieved kind of sovereign status in, uh, in society as a whole. So I'll, I'll finish up by making a, one kind of uh, a gentle provocation and say that what I'm really, what I really always write about, if, if anyone knows my, knows my scholarship, I'm sure you've noticed, I'm ex much, I, I'm almost exclusively focused on dead white men. And although on, on the surface, it might seem at first to contradict everything else I've said up till now about my orientation or my focus on the margins and on the banality in fact, I think that the dead white men are, are in the margins of our historical and historiographical imagination. There is not enough history written about the winners. I, I think that the past 30, 40, 50 years of interest in the, mar in the social margins and in the subaltern has in fact turned, these, turned the victors, the winners, the dead white men, those with power into something, into, um, it left them unexamined and left their power unexamined. They become a kind of a transcendent given, almost a ready-made uh, 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 straw man who represents, in fact, all the oppressive, all the oppressive forces in society that have uh, that have then uh, uh, brought us historians to try to retell stories of those whose uh, memories, whose, whose, whose uh, history has been forgotten. But in fact, ironically, paradoxically, perhaps, I think that the history of power 
has largely been forgotten and it hasn't been addressed. And that in fact is what the powerful are most interested in, in presenting themselves as almost as a given, as a transcendent force, as a natural force, as something that really doesn't have a history. There, there's something uh, 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 supra-historical uh, uh, about their, their place at the top of the pyramid. So, uh, so I'm, uh, most, uh, I'm very busy uh, uh, devoting most of my uh, energies to try to understand how in fact they got there. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and no, no one has accused me ever of being too subtle. So um, one of the things that I heard listening to both you and Hannah are that it's, it's almost a kind of an inverse approach, right? That Hannah goes into the archives and she expects to find swashbuckling, swashbuckling tales of something. And what she uncovers is paper and insurance and a world of risk. And from that sort of pretty finite bounded archival work builds out an analysis of risk and men who I might say seem to recess, seem to, seem to try to recede into the shadows even as they wield the levers of power. Michael goes into the archives or goes into graduate school thinking about very large questions of theory and power and liberalism um, invested by theory and comes away with incredibly finite bound. I mean, one of the things that I really do love about your work, Michael, is its materiality um, that we learn what these clerks, how these clerks lived, how they did their work, how they did the accounting and what those larger kinds of things mean. Am I completely off base here, Hannah? Are you seeing, are you, do you see resonances when you think about um, I don't know, Michael is talking about things that being banal, people being in the shadows. And from one perspective, there's, you know, it's hard to think about anyone more banal than an insurance. <laughs> I think there's probably a lot of common ground here because I, I, it, for the insurance men, it, the amount of political attention that they get is tremendously important and a measure of their skill is their ability to bring themselves forward or recede as, uh, as the situation requires. Um, and so, it, yeah, so finding the big system that they're connected to, which for me began with a simple non-theoretical um, observation of how much money um, is in insurance around the first couple decades of the founding of the United States um, is, is what led me toward trying to understand this larger question, which for me has less to do with the, the nature of capitalism and how it's um, created and stained and more with the specific politically contingent moment in time, the making of the United States. Um, so one way that I've come to understand the book project that I've been working on for so long was about how um, it was about what happens when a really old business sort of crashes into a brand new political establishment. Um, usually we think of business within the framework of a state or a sort of an eternal capitalism with its egg ebbs and flows, but at least, for, you know, I was going to say, we, we can't assume that the political framework is eternal, just like we can't assume that capitalism is eternal. Um, but for this moment when the uh, political structures are, are being created, um, it's fascinating to look at what aspects of capitalist practice they do and do not acknowledge, how they build on them, how they um, rope them in, um, how the, what they notice and what they what the state notices and what it doesn't notice about the system it's involved in. I'm I'm going to hop in and um, ask you. I mean, I I understand what you're saying about the relationship between insurance and in, insurance brokers and insurance underwriters and and this new state, the United States, but I've had the advantage of reading your book and I'm not sure that, in fact, I know for a fact that most of the people on this screen haven't. Can you just kind of lay out in narrative fashion what it is that you're talking there and then talking about there? And then we can circle back to Michael because I think you may be, I, I'm not sure that that's so clear for people. All right, we'll bring it down. Okay, merchants have money and merchants know stuff. Um, and before there's the United States, there are Americans, colonial British North Americans, who 
not only have money and not only know stuff, but they work together to manage the affairs of their region or their political entity, whatever it might be, to best suit their advantage. Uh, since the mid 18th century, there has been an increasing American amount of practice of the business of shipping insurance. And the business of shipping insurance requires an immense amount of expertise, both in what it means to buy and sell stuff and how it works, and an understanding of risk and how risk plays itself out all over the world. Um, and this is not just the risk of hurricane season or the risk of ships sinking, but in an age of constant political conflict from the biggest level wars between Britain and France to the most specific levels, there's some sketchy guys at this port who are interested in causing trouble about my paperwork. Insurers have to know all of this information. Um, and they have, a tradition of understanding themselves as merchants and particularly as insurers as subject to a sort of proto semi law, the laws of merchants that doesn't exactly sit within any particular state. And so when the United States declare their independence and these sort of ramshackle new state and federal bodies are being set up and established and hashed out, um, whatever the United States is, is to some degree at the mercy of these existing systems um, that hold within themselves a lot of money and a lot of information. Um, and I'll just give two examples to make that even more concrete. And one is that when there's a new United States and a new federal government, which has, you know, like 20 people working for it, the federal government has no idea how many American ships are being captured by the warring powers, Britain, France, Spain, anybody else. They have to ask the insurance companies, how, <laughs> what, what is the safety of Americans in the world? An incredibly politically fraught question, a question with tremendous consequences uh, for American citizens, for foreign investors. They have to ask the insurers. They don't know. Deeper than that, um, and this is from the scholarship of my dear friend Gotham Rao, um, what is an American ship and what is American stuff? Uh, legally, this has also not yet been determined. So again, this is a country that's tremendously dependent for its revenue on the importation of goods. So we have to keep import exports going. Um, uh, there are laws about who can send what where during wartime that has a lot to do with what stuff is American or what's not. Again, um, the federal institutions that have just been founded, the custom houses, have no idea what's America or not, not. They don't know how to legislate that. They're dealing with commercial actors who are expert, who have made a living out of applying the gray areas of what is America or not, because that's the way they make their most profit. Who do they have to go to to find out if something's American or not? They go to the insurers. So one thing I'm trying to do with this book is get past a sort of a Manichaean conflict on the biggest level, like is this state winning or is the free market winning at the expense of this state and to look at really the way these systems feed into one another and the way that um, coordinated commercial actors find new ways to talk about what they do um, within the context of a new political entity. They've got to figure it out. They've got to explain it. Wow. Michael, do you want to say some things about how politics does and doesn't figure, I, particularly I'm interested in hearing you think about this um, in the context of your work on, on clerks. Um, and you know, I, I'm reaching behind me and you know this lovely book here um, about what you think the political lessons are, or what the lessons about US politics or American politics are that might come out of that book? Or are there any lessons about politics and the public good that come out of that book? I know exactly, well, you go. Finish the sentence, so I have, get a better sense of where you're heading with your question. I, you know, I read the book when, when it came out and I, I loved it, which was not surprising to me. 
I went back and revisited the book in the context of preparing for today's conversation. And I was absolutely stopped to dead in my work from home virtual tracks when I read your discussion at the end of the book about the larger politics of, um, of, a, of a paperless society. And you were right very presciently, and the book came out in 18, right? But it had to have been written before then about the larger political implications of these knowledge systems that we're working with, with things like Basecamp. I don't know if you re reference Zoom in there, Microsoft Teams. I mean, this is the this is literally the world that I'm working in. This is my intellectual political economy that, you know, book that's very much about um, knowledge form, about the intersection between knowledge, structures of knowledge and the material objects and social processes through which those knowledge structures are made real, are literally realized, it seems to me there's a pretty powerful political hit at the end of that book. And I, I mean, I'm not saying I didn't think about it or absorb it the first time I read it, because of course I'm a, I'm a very attentive reader, but when I read it a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last week for this, I mean, I was, I was literally, um, stopped dead and transcribed a bunch of it and put it in a Teams message actually to Emily Sooth, who's running the Zoom session right now, um, with many exclamation points. Well, the question we end up, so any, I think any, any examination of paperwork and the political role that the, the, the critical, essential political role of paperwork, paperwork, I guess, being a synonym for knowledge, uh, knowledge production and knowledge management is that if that in fact I, I guess the central argument almost the almost the the guiding assumption for the whole study of the clerks which is not really a study of the clerks it's really a study I, 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 I call it not a social history of clerks it's actually a social history of capital and the clerk simply positioned himself right in the dead center of this dynamic in which both the capital was becoming capitalism and individuals were becoming individualism and he was doing both in in the image of the image of the of, uh, of the new this new kind of marketplace of opportunity uh, after in the in the, the middle decades of the 19th century so the essential uh, the, so the working assumption is that paper at least since at least since the invention no it, from before the invention of printing right I guess the Chinese invent paper and then we we know 2000 years ago and we know that in fact that there's already only then do we see the initial appearance of private libraries for instance in the world in the in the next millennium of course paper moves west and becomes in fact centered in Islamic culture and in fact it's the paper that we point to to explain the, the dramatic uh, not only the rise but spread of Islam uh, from uh, uh, from uh, Eastern Africa uh, to Indonesia, because it, it allowed a, a mass massive uh, production of the Quran and other uh, other religious texts, and then of course it moves into Europe and soon uh, through Spain, through Muslim Spain, and then soon uh, and then soon and then they invent they invent uh, a, 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 a printing, which uh, allows uh, an, an unprecedented opportunity to take advantage of the mechanical reproductive uh, 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 traits of the paper itself. So why am I why am I spending so much time on this? I guess because I continue to think about it. But what I really want to what I've been trying to say for five minutes is this, that in the very important nexus, it, which is constitutive of modernity as culture and as politics between knowledge and power, whether it's Francis Bacon or, or, or Thomas Hobbes, who I think together invented modern politics, the 16th and 17th century, paper is in fact the material medium that allows knowledge to be translated into power in all sorts of ways that I explain in the book. Uh, statistics and uh, accounting are, are two of the more obvious, but they're not the only ones. Uh, uh, 
insurance is another one. Uh, yeah, insure, the insurer forces the production of paperwork by his uh, merchant customers. The paperwork has to meet certain specifications. Who decides the specifications, right? That's the knot of expertise from which power emanates in a way that it that doesn't have to be acknowledged. Right, that's the amount of expertise. And of course, that becomes the practical means, the practical material means with which to share your expertise. Uh, 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 with with the rest of the world, obviously those uh, are directly uh, involved in the uh, in the event and not just. So uh, so what I end up asking at the end of the book, and it's something I think we all ask each other. We all we all should be asking each other as citizens of the third decade of the twenty first century, is what is the fate of the interrelationship of the close definitive interrelationship between power and knowledge when the when that which mediated uh, these two uh, uh, these two experiences in fact is no longer exists in other words it paper is no longer mediating the relationship between power and culture it, the uh, the electrodes are and so i begin i begin tentatively to suggest some ways to think about how this might or might not change the nature of power. I mean, we have to ask ourselves, is it simply ironic that on our, on our computer screens, we still refer to files and li I, most perversely libraries and, 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 and all sorts of other paper-based concepts, which are left only as metaphors, or in fact, as the epistemology, that is the nature of knowledge left largely unchanged. I'm increasingly pessimistic as to the future of knowledge and its relationship and its uh, relationship to power. And I think that it is, uh, in fact, a wholly different relationship, not just in, uh, obviously, in, 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 in what's the, what's the, uh, the phrase? Uh, I want to say in kind, it's a different relationship in kind and not just in, in quantity uh, and speed. So, uh, so yeah, and, and knowledge. So I'm now working on the invention of photography. That's the subject of my next book. And that's really very, very closely related to uh, the subject of, of statistics, which I devoted, I guess, a page and a half to the, in that essay, Kathy, that you published on the political geometry of the statistical table, where I try to argue that the tables actually functions as a camera. And that is because both statistics and photography, which more or less invented in the same, within the same decade, are part of a search for truth in a post-absolutist age, right? In which uh, uh, political absolutism, theological absolutism, patriarchal absolutism, it's all gone. And so there's a need now to stabilize the, the new sovereign self and ward off the dangers of the solipsism. That always, it, it, and who do I go to to try to understand it, it, this anxious search for new sources of certainty, new sources of, uh, of truth that will, Restabilize society without without reinstituting old absolutist chains of command and hierarchies and is Herman Melville. I don't know. I'm sure I'm not the only. I'm not sure I'm not the only fan here, but it's not. He didn't just write Bartleby, of course. Everything he wrote, I think, is about a world without God, and whether in fact that that is a tenable human condition, a reality. Uh, uh, I think everything uh, 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 from the 50s on at least, and uh, I think most profoundly and insightfully, he addressed those very Nietzschean questions. In fact, I, I guess he's, I would almost count him as the American Nietzschean, but, but never, but, but not willing quite to give up on his Calvinist inheritance. So, uh, so, I, so that's also about the invention of objectivity, which obviously is closely related to accounting st statistics and, and photography, but also medical pathology. That's something that makes uh, hysteria is such a difficult uh, issue uh, for society at large in the 19th century. And might make, as feminists have long argued, might actually uh, reveal hysteria to be one of the most important uh, uh, moments of resistance to the new fraternité, right? The new kind of uh, uh, gendered regime of democratic, of equal democratic, white democratic citizens. They're actually white for the first time as well after 1820. So I, I don't even remember what you asked me, but I've... Uh, well, um, I, I'm not free sure... Free association, I, right? Yeah, I think um, 
I think it's probably time to shift gears just a bit. I want to briefly throw out an invitation that if you've got a question, um, this would be a good time to put it into the chat because we will be pivoting to q and A, I I think shortly, um, a larger, broader audience, um, audience kind of Q&A. Um, I guess one of the places that I would like I'd like to end up is you know, we've had a you've had a discussion that's ranged around a lot of a lot of different um, a lot of different topics you know, the economy culture knowledge systems paper insurers risk as wide ranging as the conversation has been and gone in lots of different directions. Um, I will say that one of the things that distinguishes both of your writing as people who write, as, you know, who not only do research and think, but who also write about it and um, sum it up and put it out there for in a form that I think informs, plural, that appeal to scholars, but also that are generally readable um, by members of an educated public, at least how you think about writing. I know that um, in, in, in the case of, of, of both of your, both of your sort of corpus of work, um, it's arresting to me how you're able to um, frame the things that you write about in ways that are exciting. I mean, the, the prologue or the introduction to Hannah's book that literally walks one through the process of buying an, a marine insurance policy, thinking about some of the work that Michael did, um, not in his, not in either accounting for capitalism or in ready-made democracy, but in an, a special issue of um, commonplace, an online sort of crossover journal um, that, that he, co-edited, I asked him to co-edit years and years ago, called Hard Times. There is there is a way in which you both can write very stylishly and do write stylishly in a way that engages readers um, who aren't necessarily the people who are shored in, who are hip deep in the kinds of technical work that you both do. And I'm wondering if you would share a bit, especially given that we are in a moment when um, academics are encouraged again and again and again to write for a broader public that are um, that we gain purchase by reaching larger audiences, that the kind of work that we do um, in scholarly circles narrowly defined or in the classroom no longer seems to have, um, you know, no longer seems to be quite enough. You both managed to have developed styles and ways of writing and being in the world as writers, as well as scholars um, that cross that divide. And I'm wondering if you would say a bit about how you think about writing and Hannah, if you wanna start or how you learned to do it. So I stole my preface concept. I'll admit it right here on video. Yeah. Um, and I was UC yeah. Berkeley, at Berkeley, um, one of the most famed senior professors in our department was Mary Elizabeth Berry, um, who, uh, whose book was featured in our sort of how to learn to write seminar in grad school, which like most of these seminars are, they just show you a, a bunch of books. And then you say, well, you talk for two hours, like, well, how is this one written? And then sometimes the authors come in and sometimes they, you learn about this really fraught struggle. And sometimes as in the case of Beth Berry, who was so serenely the master of her art that she just said, well, of course it had to be written this way. Um, and uh, I didn't gain so much from that statement being more on the struggle end of things myself, but uh, I did still her preface format, the second person walk through the insurance office. So. Um, uh, that's very thank thanks for that. Her book is called Japan in Print, uh, and it's imagining that you are looking at early modern Japanese maps and trying to figure out how to make a journey and thinking about the landmarks you recognize along the way. So my preface is a visit to the insurance office, which 
you know, puts you in in the shoes of somebody who you might not wish to be. And some people in my department didn't like my preface either and said, you know, I'm not that guy. Don't make me that guy who visits the office. That's not how I how I do. But it was certainly um, a response to what I've wanted from so many great history of capitalism books that I've read recently, which is just to understand how it works. Um, and once you understand how it works, not just how it felt, um, not just what's the abstract sort of big apparatus we're connected to, but how how exactly does this work? And, and rebuilding from that really low level mechanics of how something works to understand the moments where big decisions are being made, to understand the moments where you lock into bigger systems. So I was flabbergasted after I finished my dissertation when I sat down to what I thought would be an easy day of writing to say what happens at the visit to the insurance office. And I got it to in two paragraphs and I was like, oh my gosh. I have a lot more work to do because I, I've been skipping ahead to the framework, um, to the politics, to the big picture, to the numbers. And I just have to understand what happens when this is people in a room acting according to all of the different signposts that people use when they decide what to do, like how somebody greets with them when they come in the door, what time do they go, um, what, who's gossiping about who, where, what information do people actually use to make decisions? Um, so that was such an enlightening process for me that uh, I'm, I'm glad that Kathy let me keep it. <laughs> Michael? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I, and thank you for recognizing a, the rather obsessive effort I make, at least with my prose. Overly obsessive effort, but I'll leave that aside uh, for a different forum, a more intimate forum. Um, I, I just want to say that I consider history to be a literary genre, not a social science. And uh, the only difference being, of course, that we're not allowed to make things up. But other than that, uh, uh, my, uh, my ambition is to attempt to, re, to, to capture or recapture the human drama in ways that the advantages of hindsight allow us to do. Uh, yeah, I actually, I move back and forth between two languages. I actually find that difficult. I think, some, I think that's how certain brains are wired. And so, so I'm often confused it takes me a long time to write, I, uh, but anyway, it's very important writing. No, I mean, it, yeah, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that I, um, I mean, I've I've edited alongside you, and I've edited behind you when we've collaborated on special issues for things, and you seem to be. I don't know if you're a, a fast or slow writer, but you're a definitely a very fast editor. I mean, you're, you're incisive as an editor, for sure. Right. And I'm also drawn to language. Uh, I, a lot of my, a lot of, a, a lot of scholarly insights from you, or a lot of questions, a lot of historical questions are actually provoked by certain kind of etymological details or moments. And one of my favorite sources, which I discovered as a graduate student in the bowels of, uh, I guess it was at Columbia, actually Butler Library in Columbia before the renovation. So everything was dark and dusty. And I found the second, I, I found the second edition of Daniel Webster's American Dictionary, it, which included in fact an appendix, which listed all the new words that had been added to the 1841 uh, second edition that had not appeared in the 1828 first edition. And I've been living with that list ever since as kind of this, this, this moment, this conscious verbalization of America's great transformation from an agrarian republic into an industrial democracy, because those are exactly the years. All right, um, I'm gonna, we have questions in the chat and we probably have got just enough time to, um, to ask them. Ken Hawkins asks, what types of archival sources proved most helpful in getting at how power manifested itself in marine insurance and accounting beyond ledgers? So uh, letters to politicians really help. Letters from politicians to insurance companies, city directories that try to take stock of what a city 
is and how you should boast about it. We have five banks, we have four insurance companies. Um, that's an element in the city landscape. Um, then you can contrast that to maps where insurance companies, until they start advertising to the public, don't have to have much of a public presence at all. So in the in the physical landscape, they're non-entities, but for commercial travelers, for commercial gazettes, they're for, for almanacs, they're absolutely crucial. So there's a story in Disjuncture there. Um, uh, newspapers that continually broadcast when companies are having their elections um, sort of reveal these names of city cliques that are in power in various different ways that are fighting with each other or allied with each other. Those are helpful. Um, and even more than the list of names, the list of dividends. Um, there's this period of time when insurance companies are just pulling in these massive halls um, that they're distributing to their shareholders. And nobody with an eye to the urban news could fail to notice a company that's announcing a dividend of 10 or 12% on a period of six months. I mean, the, the, the sort of political reconfiguration just by this broadcasting of the amount of money um, that these companies are throwing back at their shareholders is really extraordinary. So those are the, some of the things that have been most helpful to me to look at, to talk about. Um, and then sneaky private letters, which you don't get to see very much, but letters that reveal, for example, that people are planning to create all kinds of financial institutions at the same time to interlock with one another. So banks and insurance companies are cousins, and the insurance company is the quiet cousin that does a lot of the support work, but doesn't attract as much political criticism as a bank. So when you have these two kinds of companies working together, they're more than the sum of their parts. So that's one thing that you can look at, the way that they, they aren't necessarily talked about. And I'll just tell one more quick story about that, which is um, from a moment in New York history when there's a boom in incorporations, financial companies, banks, fire insurance companies, marine insurance companies, um, and two brothers um, are working together to get their insurance company an official state charter. And one of them is uh, the finance guy. He's back in Manhattan. And the guy that they send to the state legislature is not the known finance banker guy. It's the old sea captain. And he literally says that when he's trying to work over the state legislators, he goes around and he glad hands them and he tells them old sea stories. And eventually they get bored of him and they, you know, he wanders off to the corner and they stop paying attention. And then he eavesdrops on the political gossip of the day. So it, it's a conscious strategy for company founders to uh, have themselves not be seen as political actors. That's a great political strategy in and of itself. You don't see it very often written down, but when you do, it's pretty great. Oh God, I'd forgotten about them. Um, Michael, what kinds of archival sources were most helpful for you in getting at how power manifested itself? Excluding oh, it, it was a, it's an endless list. I wanted to just say something more specifically to Ken about the, the ledgers, uh, which on an archival level weren't, uh, weren't terribly interesting. And that is because the technology, the 15th century technology hadn't really, since of the invention of uh, double entry, hadn't dramatically changed, at least not on the epistemological level of what is uh, knowable and how do we know it. Uh, I, and, and, and I wasn't terribly interested in the invention of new uh, techniques for devaluing a uh, fixed capital uh, in, the, uh, in the new railroad corporations. Uh, because of my more cultural or social, as I mentioned before, I was aspiring to write a social history of capital. What really interested me about the ledgers was how and why, more specifically, why did the bottom line become synonymous with absolute truth in the middle of the 19th century. That harks back to what I earlier said about the importance of language as a, as a clue or almost as a wedge uh, uh, to uh, get deep into, uh, into contemporary uh, experiences of the social. Uh, so I, yeah, so, uh, so I was interested in, in the bottom line as in fact, in, in its relationship, how accounting, uh, how accounting becomes a favorite, and thus it, it gets introduced to, into the school curriculum. Horace Mann introduces it in his uh, in his uh, 
uh, uh, well-known school reforms in the end of the 1830s. And what it does and what, what and why, and I can tell you, I'll try to tell you in one sentence, is what it does is, is it establishes, in fact, an objective, uh, using numbers, an objective set of, uh, an objective, um, it exhibits an objective situation or condition it stabilizes it and it fixes it without, however, at the same time, a, a sacrificing the mobility and the fluidity and the uncertainty, or as Hannah would likes to say, the risk that is inherent, in fact, in a successful capitalist economy. So that's something that, uh, 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 the, uh, that's why the bottom line, I think, becomes, it acquires such a profound cultural uh, uh, cachet. All right, we have one last question and it's gonna be because we are really on the margins of running out of time. It's gonna be a better or worse. It's a single single answer question that could, I mean, you could, you could go on for, for a long time but it's gonna be better or worse. Um, this is from Josh Greenberg, um, who is no, no, no stranger to the study of all things paper that are connected to money. I have a question about paperwork. As we move through the 18th and into the early 19th century, more and more of the population is being brought into an economy where they're responsible for dealing with paper forms, paper currencies, and so on. Is this expanding realm of practices good or bad for most people? Good or bad, things getting better, things getting worse. Michael, better or worse? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Hannah. Better. Knowledge is good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you both so much. We are out of time. I want to thank both Michael and, um, and Hannah uh, for joining us today and for giving us a terrific conversation that went far, far, far beyond where I thought it might go. I wanna give a shout out to Amelie Suth, who's in the background hiding behind that Omahundro Institute slide. She's been running all of the tech for us. And also to thank all of you for coming and for attending. A reminder again that um, I think in the chat, but for sure on the Omahundro Institute webpage for online events, there are links to um, discounted copies of all of these books. So if you don't have them, this is a good chance to get them. Thank you so much to all of, to, to everyone. Um, we you. really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. If you buy my book, I'll send you a custom book plate with an underwriter on it. So keep that in mind. <laughs> oh, I don't have one of those. <laughs> I'll send you some, Kathy. I made the on Zazzle. <laughs> have a great <laughs> afternoon, everybody. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care.